You know, I think the question, when you write a book like this, the first question that you have to answer is, do we really need another book about the Kennedy assassination? Is there anything new to be said about the assassination of President Kennedy? Are there new materials that, are, that have suddenly become available and have not been available for the past 46 years that allow us to see these events in a different light? And obviously, my answer to that question is yes, for very selfish purposes. Um, most of the books, the vast majority of books, and you, know, you could fill a small library with, with uh, books and articles that have been written about the assassination, they focus on one question, one singular question, and that is, who shot JFK? Where did the bullets come from? Was there a shooter on the grassy knoll? Was Oswald, was Oswald a patsy? You know, was this part of a, a coup on the part of the military industrial complex because of initiatives that Kennedy had taken? These issues are fascinating, and they have inspired what is and remain and will remain a passionate debate among people on all different sides of, of this issue. That's not what this book is about. I am not writing a book about who shot JFK. I have no new theories to offer about where the bullets came from or who shot JFK. This is actually a very different book. What I'm interested in is not who shot JFK. I'm interested in the transfer of political power that takes place in the hours after the assassination. And I want to move the focus away from the tragedy that's unfolding in the presidential limousine and move it back about 60 feet to the car carrying Lyndon Johnson. Follow Lyndon Johnson over the course of the day as he goes to Parkland Hospital and then to Air Force One and then back to Washington, D.C. to give people a sense of the texture of the decisions that he had to face and the choices that he confronted. When you think about it, the Kennedy assassination represented the most dramatic and sudden transfer of political power in American history. Kennedy was the first chief executive to die instantly from his wounds, even Abraham Lincoln who was shot at point-blank range at the Ford Theater, survived and lived until the following morning when he died. Kennedy died instantly, which confronted Johnson with what I believe was an unprecedented crisis. What I'm interested in is the issues of crisis management and presidential leadership in the hours that followed the assassination. And I focus on the first 24 hours, you know, which is very different from other books that I've written and the books that other professional historians, right? Because normally what we're trying to do is to connect the dots, to tell the story of change over a period of time. But what I try to do here instead is to focus on a single 24-hour period to give you a sense of the texture of the moment. You know, my students over the years have always complained that, that number one, I talk too fast, and number two, that history is boring. They say history is boring because we know the conclusion. We know the end of the story, so why do we need to learn about dates and names and times? And I, what I find fascinating about history is being able to go back in a moment of time and understand that the past has many different possible paths, that there are lots of possibilities, choices that were not taken, and to put people back in that moment at that time to understand the range of choices, in this case, that Lyndon Johnson faced, and to realize how contingency and unintended consequences play in the historical process and produce a result which no one at the time could have anticipated. And by focusing on 24 hours, by, by focusing on some of the, deal, the details that oftentimes get airbrushed out of history, I think we're able to transport people back to that moment. So you not only can now, with the benefit of hindsight, get a sense of to reevaluate some of the decisions that Lyndon Johnson made, but you can also put yourself back in that moment. So you're at Parkland Hospital, and someone comes to you, and you, you have the same information in front of you that Lyndon Johnson had in front of him. You find out the president has been shot, that this is possibly the first uh, in, uh, shot in what could potentially be a confrontation with the Soviet Union. What do you do in that moment? What choices do you make? I know what I would do. I would hyperventilate and pass out. That's why I'm a professor and not a president. But it allows the individuals, people who are reading this book, the idea is to allow people to go back in that moment of time and experience it, and experience the same type of situations and the same choices that Lyndon Johnson confronted. And not only is the, the framework different, but I also, in terms of the issue, there are new sources that are available. And uh, I am very grateful to the family of William Manchester, who gave me access to uh, all of the research materials that Mr. Manchester used to write his 
very controversial and best-selling book, uh, The Death of a President, was published in 1967. And if you go back, these materials were opened up last year for the first time. I was the first one to use them. And these materials, you know, almost all of these people, with a few exceptions, are now dead. But when you go back and you look at the interviews, Manchester interviewed all the major players back in 1964 and 1965 when this material was still fresh. And these people come alive. And what also comes alive are some of the, the human dimensions to this story, the human dimensions that have been, I think, left out of the Warren Commission, for example, which, as you know, is a legal brief, which is sort of very clinical and very concise, but also uh, uh, it is not, it's focused on solving a, pr a crime, and it's not focused on Lyndon Johnson or his actions after, um, uh, after the assassination. And I also found that people just volunteered and gave Manchester material material that was not available to the Warren Commission. So there are, for example, documents uh, in the Manchester Papers which he chose not to use and parts of interviews which he chose not to use, which I think provide a fresh light, new perspective on the events that took place that day. I also, I, I sought out the Manchester Papers and I found them. They're at Wesleyan University in the Special Collections uh, Archive at Wesleyan University. I also came across a very valuable and useful oral history that was conducted by the president, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library in 1978 with Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh. And McHugh was President Kennedy's Air Force aide on November 22, 1963. And this, is, this is just falls into the category of pure dumb luck. I happened to be working at the Kennedy Library on the day, 31 years after he conducted the interview, that McHugh's interview was declassified. So within hours of it being open to the public, I was able to get access to it and use it in this book for the first time. And I want to talk a little bit later on about some of the insights that this um, oral history provides us. But finally, there are just, because I'm asking different questions of the material, there's a lot of information that's been open to the public for a long time that other people looking into this issue have not focused on. There's a, at both the Johnson Library and at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., for example, there is a report conducted by the Secret Service were all the Secret Service agents involved in the, uh, the presidential detail and the vice presidential detail gave very detailed reports of what they were doing on that day, what they saw, and when they saw them. Now, most people, the few people who have used this report have been looking at it primarily to glean information about the assassination. But if you look at it instead to try to get a sense of what Lyndon Johnson is doing, you get this, this, this uh, great understanding of, of Lyndon Johnson and every step he's taking and who's in the room and who he's talking to. And it's really essential in trying to tell the story. So, so what do you end up with and what's new? So there's new questions you're asking using a different format and you have new sources. So what is it that I'm able to say about November 22nd, 1963 that no one has said before? Well, the first part of the story that I think is important is the events that take place in Parkland Hospital, the roughly 40 minutes that Lyndon Johnson is at Parkland Hospital from 1240 until around 130 when he leaves for Air Force One. And the question that I try to, the question that I asked of the material, which has not been asked before, is why does it take so long for Lyndon Johnson to find out that Kennedy is dead? According to the Warren Commission, Kennedy is shot at 12.30. They arrive at, the, at Parkland Hospital at 12.40. Kennedy is pronounced dead at 1 o'clock. Lyndon Johnson finds out that Kennedy is dead at 1.20. I think that timeline is actually wrong for reasons I'd be happy to elaborate on later. But here's what happens. Lyndon Johnson, just to set the stage for Parkland Hospital, Lyndon Johnson is two cars behind President Kennedy in the motorcade as they turn on the Dealey Plaza. When the first shot rings out, Johnson hears it, and he doesn't think anything of it. He said he's been in motorcades his whole life. For him, it was just, it sounded like backfire from a motorcycle. He wasn't the least bit alarmed. Rufus Youngblood, who was the Secret Service agent sitting in the front seat of the car, hears the same sound. He's also not alarmed. But what he sees does alarm him. He looks out, and he's looking now at the grassy knoll, where the vice presidential car is making the turn onto Elm. And he sees people falling to the ground. And then he looks ahead, and he sees in front of him, he sees what he describes as unusual movements in the presidential car. So Youngblood leaps out of the front seat of the car, and he jumps over the back seat, and he grabs Lyndon Johnson, and he throws him to the floor of the car. And as Johnson is being thrown to the floor of the car, you hear the second shot and the third shot, and depending on what theories you believe, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth shot. But Lyndon Johnson is on the floor of the limousine. He hears these shots, but he doesn't see anything. He hasn't seen anything in a presidential motorcade. 
As soon as he's on the floor and, and, and Rufus Youngblood, all 180 pounds of Rufus Youngblood are on top of him, the car picks up speed. They begin this frantic race to Parkland Hospital. Johnson doesn't know what's going on. He feels the car accelerate. He hears, we have to realize, this car is going 70 miles an hour. It's